All right, today is camera spotlight on Fidget Revolution, and today we are talking about my Zeiss Icon Hologon camera. Um, this is an amazing tool that not many people have ever seen, as there were only 1,400 of these ever produced. Um, I picked this up a couple of years ago, have made a lot of work with it, which I'll be sharing, and it's really an incredible camera. What makes this camera so great, it's all about the lens. The lens on this camera is a 15 millimeter fixed focus, fixed f-stop, uh, it's an f8 lens, so f8 and b there. This camera has some of the most incredible depth of field and some of the most three-dimensional sharpness that I've ever seen in an analog picture-taking device. Um, the 15 millimeter lens keeps everything in focus from 20 inches to infinity. So you're literally just walking around and shooting. There's no need to adjust focus and also no need to ever change the f-stop because you can't. Everything is controlled simply through the shutter speeds on top, which go from bulb all the way out to a 500th of a second. Um, when you hold the camera, it is incredibly well built. It feels like a tank. When Zeiss built this camera, they first had designed the lens. It's a three element lens. I personally think it's one of the greatest, I think it might be the greatest wide angle 35 millimeter film lens ever created. Um, I would compare this to those of you that have worked with a Hasselblad super wide. It's kind of like that. It has almost no distortion. I mean, it's basically distortion free and it's fantastic with film. Um, as I said, there were 1,400 of these cameras made. Now, when the company was going bankrupt, there were another 225 of the lenses left over. Those lenses were bought by Leica, and Leica made in 1972, I believe it was, uh, 225 of them with a uh, auxiliary viewfinder, at that time making it the widest M lens that Leica had ever uh, produced. And it was also a lens not made by Leica, which is really kind of interesting. Um, those lenses, if you find one today, will literally cost you somewhere between fifteen and twenty thousand dollars. They are very expensive and very collectible. However, the original Zeiss uh, Hologon camera, like this, you can purchase for a couple thousand dollars. Complete kits might be as much as five or six thousand dollars. So it is not inexpensive. But if you're a wide-angle shooter who shoots thirty-five and who wants no distortion and really wants a three-dimensional quality to their images. It's kind of hard to say no. You can see how thin the camera is. I mean, the lens is just this bubble that's on the inside. It's really incredible. And what's interesting about the camera is that they designed the lens first and then had to find a camera to put it into. The lens doesn't come off the camera. So the lens was made and then someone said, you know, crap, what camera are we gonna put it on? Well, there's a camera system called the Contraflex. It was made also by Zeiss Icon at that time. And the, the body is essentially a contraflex body that's been modified to accept uh, this lens. The cool part about that means though, that even though there were only 1,400 of these cameras made, there were a lot of the contraflex cameras made. And the, a lot of the repair parts and everything for those cameras work perfectly on this camera. So there are parts available to keep these cameras up and running. One part that I really loved was this. This is an interchangeable film back that can go on this camera. I have a couple of these. These were not terribly expensive, a couple hundred dollars, and they allow you to load up a roll of 35 millimeter film. It has a standard dark slide, like you would imagine, like in a four by five camera, sheet camera, and I can change the film that's in the camera whenever I want. So I could have a roll of 3200 speed loaded in here and have another one of these with 25 speed film and be changing it while I'm out in the field. That just I think is incredible cool flexibility when working with this camera. Um, another interesting thing is because it's so wide angle, it's a 110 degree angle of view, 15 millimeter F8, um, there is naturally going to be some fall off on the lens. Now I shoot this camera 99% of the time without the center filter, which corrects for it. Um, I've never really found a problem with it. If I was shooting really high contrast material, or if I was working with a uh, transparency material, that had a, you know, like a Velvia or something, I might put a center filter on. Um, I'm gonna shoot with the center filter today, but all the examples that I've showed you, that I'll be showing you here in the video, uh, did not have the center filter on it. I found with black and white material, you don't need it. The center filter is incredibly rare, um, very difficult to find. Uh, it's 4X, you can see it's graduated from the center out, and it simply screws onto the front of the camera like this, 
There are no additional rings on the outside. You can't put a hood, you can't put anything like that on this. This camera is so wide that if I were taking a picture like this, my hands would be showing up in the photograph. So the way that you have to hold the camera is something like this. I press it like this, that way my hands are completely underneath and behind the camera. It's kind of like anybody who's ever worked with a wide lust camera. If you have your hands anywhere on the front, for the most part, you're gonna get them in the frame. Same thing is true with this. The lens being a 15 inch is so wide that you have to shoot at something like this. Uh, in the viewfinder, which is very clean, very beautiful, and very bright, there is also a bubble level. And as long as your horizon line and the bubble in that level is dead center, the distortion on this camera, as I said, is absolutely minimal to none. Um, so I spent probably f a few months putting together this kit a year and a half ago. I even found an original lens cap, metal lens cap. These are, if, it didn't, if you can't find everything as the kit, it's really hard to put it together later. Um, it took me a while. But what's great about the setup is it's, that it's just so small, it's so well built, and it's so much fun to shoot with because you're literally just responding to a scene. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna load up a roll of Tri-X. Um, it's fresh, it's not expired. I'm gonna process this in DDX. We'll do that probably tomorrow morning as part of this video. And we're gonna go for a walk. Uh, my wife and I are gonna go for a walk for a couple of miles. It's a beautiful winter day here in Vermont. As I said, I'm gonna shoot with the center filter on today, just cause that way I can show you examples of both. We'll process the film, we're gonna scan the film, and then uh, we'll take a look and see what we got. So let's load up uh, the camera right now and I'll show you how that process works. So before I start loading the film, I wanted to show you just a little bit more on how that lens looks. It's like a bubble on the front. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. Um, as I said, the construction is so well done. Um, shutter speeds are laid out over here with your frame counter, standard release button, and over here you just have a setting to be able to remember you know, what type of film you have loaded in the camera. Uh, so in order to load the film, I'm always very cautious about protecting that front lens. So when I load the film, a lot of times I'll put the lens cap back on. Um, on the bottom, there are two knobs. One, this is for rewinding and this is for removing the back. In order to load the film, you turn this one, you turn this one, and the entire back comes off. So then over here goes your uh, cassette, over here goes the leader. And if you were going to use this back on it, this take up here and this cassette come out because these are already built in that back. So let's go ahead and load up some film. The last thing I need to do is you need to set the frame counter and I'm going to set this to 36 right there and it'll count down backwards as we go to one so I know exactly how many shots. And the way I'm going to do this, as I said, we're going to shoot Tri-X today in this camera. And my plan, because I have the center filter on, that means we're going to have a uh, two-stop loss of light that I'm going to have to correct for. So Tri-X is going to be exposed at EI 100 instead of 400. And I'm going to process it, uh, I think, in DDX. That should be a really good combination. So we're all set. Let's go for a walk. All right, so I've gone to a great spot that I love shooting at. I love these abandoned buildings. I love the sense of depth between the window and the far landscape here. I've done a meter reading. It's 60th of a second at F8. Once again, we're shooting Tri-X, but we're going to rate it at 100 to compensate for the uh, center filter that I have on the camera. And I'm going to try to fill the frame a great deal with the window. So you'll get a sense of that depth, the depth of field that I'm talking about, how the window and the presence of the board is really big, yet the distance out there all the way to the mountain feels really sharp. So I've got my shutter speed set. Let's give it a shot. I'm probably only about four, four and a half feet from the window right now. All right, I feel really good about that. I've got a setup here in my kitchen where we're gonna look at, you know, how this camera with this amazing lens 
renders this portrait of my wife at two feet, three feet, four feet, five feet, six feet. And then I'm gonna scan it as one long strip so we can look at how any kind of distortions or anything's changed. There should be, once again, minimal distortion. I've got the camera about as level and as square as I can get it for this environment. And I've got it set so it's looking pretty much straight into her. That it should give us the best rendering. So I've got my 50 foot tape here. And I'll just double check. Yeah, it's damn close to two feet right on her glasses. Um, and because the light is so contrasting here this morning, uh, A, I've taken the center filter off of the camera. I didn't feel it was necessary in here. As I said, I don't normally use it. And I'm gonna use my Pentex digital spot meter to meter the scene. So since we're not using the center filter and we're shooting Tri-X, I've got the meter set to 400. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna meter the dark side of her face here. And let's see, that's a six, one, six. So I'm gonna place that at a zone three. And then I'm gonna look at the light side of her face. And that's a 12. So that, that's a big difference. That 12 means that it's well over a zone nine. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have to let the shadows fall and hope that the contrast and the developer will make it work okay. So I'm gonna place the light side of her face, where's that right there? That's a nine, and your format right there at 10. If I place that, let's say a six, 12, yeah, I can, I can hold a zone eight, um, zone nine, and then the shadows over here are flying at a seven, eight, yeah, okay, so the exposure is going to be F8 at a 30th. So thank God for uh, film latitude with uh, Tri-X. Okay, E, so here we go. One shot each. Camera is all set. It is on a 30th. Everything looks good. Here we go. All right, I'm going to advance the frame. And now what we have to do is break out the tape measure again. Yeah, and hold it like right there. And I'm gonna go to three feet. And about there. And then what I'm gonna do is quickly square everything up just to make sure that nothing has changed. I'm squaring everything to my house. It should be pretty good though. Yeah. And okay, second shot, exactly the same exposure. Okay, now let's go to four feet. Okay, so I've already advanced the film, yes. Okay, so now we're at four feet. And then we'll do one more at five feet. All right. So this is the final exposure at five feet once again. You said you were going to do six feet too. I'm willing to do five. Okay, maybe I'll do six. Hold on. So here we go. <laughs> five feet. All right. I'm running out of room here in the kitchen, but I guess I could do one more. Let's do six. I'm here to keep you on. I guess. Okay, that looks good. Let me check side to side. Looks pretty darn good. Okay, last exposure at six feet. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is uh, take this film out to the studio. I've got the Jobo warmed up. We're gonna process it in DDX, one to four, one to nine, not quite sure yet. And then I'll do a scan and uh, we'll get to the next part. All right, so I've got the Jobo, it's all set, 20 degrees Celsius. Eight minutes is the proper processing time for one to four at box speed for Tri-X and DDX. But because I'm gonna do it in a Jobo, that continuous agitation, um, I've gotta compensate for that. Some people say compensate 15%, other people don't. I have found that with the Ilford developer, that simply by doing the pre-wet, it solves all the problems. So I'm gonna do an at temp pre-wet for about a minute. Um, Jobo would recommend five, but I find that with DDX, a minute's enough, and that should help with our contrast. Developer. It's just about perfectly at 10. 
So once we do this one minute pre-wet, we'll dump it, dump in the developer eight minutes. I'm also gonna slow down the rotation on the motor. Uh, my normal is P, which is 75 RPM, uh, but based upon a lot of experience in controlling the highlights, I'm gonna pull it down to about three and a half, three and a quarter, so it'll be a little slower, and that'll also help control that overall contrast that I know we're gonna have from such a big scene. All right. Developers at temp. All right, so it's been a minute. I'm gonna drain out the pre-wet. I'm gonna set it to eight minutes. I'm gonna slow it down to three and three quarters. Dump in the developer, hit the timer, eight minutes, and then we're gonna stop. All right, eight minutes is just about up. I'm draining the developer, but I'm also gonna put the speed back up to P now. And I'm gonna put the stop bath in. 30 seconds. And then we'll hop into fix. All right, fixer, I'm using TF4, which is the non acidic fix. I'm going to run it. It's a little old, not bad old, but a little old. And I'm gonna run it for approximately six minutes just to make sure the negative is completely fixed. All right, so the last step in my process is clear. I'm gonna be using permawash. I've used it forever. Um, I think it does a really great job. Then I'm gonna do a quick uh, rinse for about five minutes, clean up the Jobo, and uh, set the film to dry. All right, so the film has been washing in the Jobo for a couple of minutes. I do this because not only does it give a really good wash to the film, but it also helps clean the Jobo. Uh, one of the most important things when you're processing film is keeping everything as clean as possible. You don't want to have any kind of cross-contamination. So I spend a fair amount of time after running film making sure that everything is properly wiped down. I run even more water through the Jobo, make sure my tanks are perfectly clear because I don't want to have any kind of cross-contamination when I come back to process another run of film. I'll also dry everything down just to be 100% perfect. So the last step in processing this test roll is adding just a dot of wetting agent. I have water coming in at temp. I will let that soak for probably two to three minutes and then I'll hang it to dry. All right, so the negatives look really good. They're nicely developed, everything's clean. The test images of even the kitchen look really great, at least from a processing standpoint. So I'll hang them to dry now, about 45 minutes, and then we'll do some scanning. All right, so the scan is starting, and I decided to do it at 3150 resolution. Um, the Imicon can max out at uh, 60, uh, 300 or 6200, but I decided uh, it just this should be more than enough resolution to show us what we're looking at a little faster. All right, it's as you can see, the two foot one is not bad. It's a little bit of distortion on her face and her arms, but man, it's a 15 millimeter lens and it looks great. Here comes three feet. I think three feet is really good. Um, it definitely has that wide angle feel, but look at the sense of depth and the sharpness and the clarity. It's, it's really uh, quite incredible. Once you get to four feet though, this is where I really feel for like an environmental portrait, you're starting to get like the right sense of the person. I really like how four feet and beyond feels. That's not to say I wouldn't use the closure, but if it was a person, I'm thinking four feet is really, get, really where it gets great. Here we are at five feet once again. I love the sense of place. I love seeing in the other room, you're seeing outside. It just, it helps tell a story when you have that much information. And when you get to six feet, once again, look at how much is included. 15 millimeter lens is just so wide. Everything's in the frame and what a wonderful way to work. Here's that example of that building outside. You can see just how sharp it is, how the window has this tremendous presence, and yet the window and the hill on the far side are all equally sharp. It has this tremendous sense of depth of field.
Here's another image that I made last summer when I was testing film for uh, Ferrania. Look at the contrast, look at the sharpness, look at the detail. It has this, you know, there's no distortion. It just has this tremendous sem sense of like you're there and you can walk into the frame. Another image that I did on Ferrania P30, you know, this Airstream, you know, wonderful contrast control, density control, um, and just the, the image is just so sharp and so clear that every rivet in the text is totally legible. Another image uh, from the fairground that I was photographing in Salem, New York, once again, tremendous sense of depth, tremendous sense of sharpness from foreground to background, great contrast control. It really just has everything that I want. Now, these next images are actual artworks of mine. Um, these are done creating overlapping frames of content all done in camera. So I'm advancing and rewinding the film. Um, it's tricky to do on this particular camera, but not impossible. This is a pro an image that I made in our back field. Um, here's an image that I made out in Provincetown, Cape Cod. Once again, look at the sense of depth, the sense of foreground to background, the sense of just you know contrast control, um, I mean, multi-coatings that are made now are definitely better than the coatings that were made back in the, uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. But just look at how well it's controlled. And I really find that the micro clarity and just the overall glow that that particular lens makes, especially with great black and white film. All of these examples are seen right now, by the way, we're either on T-Max 100 or in uh, the Ferrania P30. Those are two films that I work with a great deal, probably processed in the Rodinal for sure in the Ferrania. Here's another one from Cape Cod and Wellfleet that I made. And I, it was a bright, beautiful, you know, summer day. And look at how the foliage feels. Look at the sharpness in the depth in the trees and in the flowers on the ground and in the snow fence that you're about to see that's coming up. It's just so clear. And from a creative standpoint, I'm not having to focus. I'm just looking what's in front of me and thinking how these different images are going to build upon each other. And because the field of view is so wide, you know, really what I'm seeing, all of that gets in the frame. It, it, it really is a wonderful and creative process to work with. And here's one more example. This was made in Shelburne Farms here in Vermont. It was this beautiful summer day as well. And I just absolutely love the narrative feeling. I love the sense of near and far and some of the flair that you're getting there on that tree. You know, this is a classic vintage film lens design. Three-dimensional really was everything. So I hope you enjoy these images. Let's get to the conclusion. In conclusion, the Zeiss Icon Hologon ultra-wide camera, you know, I think the images and everything you've seen in this video really speak for themselves. If, as I said, if you're an ultra wide photography shooter, 35 millimeter, and you're looking for something that's unique, that gives you a different sense of uh, visual quality than what you could get uh, with even, even the more modern uh, wide angle lenses, I would highly recommend you look for a Hologon camera. It's just a joy to shoot with. Thank you very much for listening. Can't wait to hear your thoughts. Now go shoot some film.